Book One, Chapter Eleven of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great by Henry Fielding. Book One, Chapter Eleven. Containing as notable instances of human greatness as are to be met with in ancient or modern history concluding with some wholesome hints to the gay part of mankind wild no sooner parted from the chaste laetitia than recollecting that his friend the count was returned to his lodgings in the same house he resolved to visit him for he was none of those half-bred fellows who are ashamed to see their friends when they have plundered and betrayed them from which base and pitiful temper many monstrous cruelties have been transacted by men who have sometimes carried their modesty so far as to the murder or utter ruin of those against whom their consciences have suggested to them that they have committed some small trespass either by the debauching a friend's wife or daughter belying or betraying the friend himself or some other such trifling instance in our hero there was nothing not truly great he could without the least abashment drink a bottle with the man who knew he had the moment before picked his pocket and when he had stripped him of everything he had never desired to do him any further mischief for he carried good nature to that wonderful and uncommon height that he never did a single injury to man or woman by which he himself did not expect to reap some advantage he would often say that by the contrary party men often made a bad bargain with the devil and did his work for nothing our hero found the captive count not basely lamenting his fate nor abandoning himself to despair but with due resignation employing himself in preparing several packs of cards for future exploits the count little suspecting that wilde had been the sole contriver of the misfortune which had befallen him rose up and eagerly embraced him and wilde returned his embrace with equal warmth they were no sooner seated than wilde took an occasion from seeing the cards lying on the table to inveigh against gaming and with an usual and highly commendable freedom after first exaggerating the distressed circumstances in which the count was then involved imputed all his misfortunes to that cursed itch of play which he said he concluded had brought his present confinement upon him and must unavoidably end in his destruction the other with great alacrity defended his favourite amusement or rather employment and having told his friend the great success he had after his unluckily quitting the room acquainted him with the accident which followed and which the reader as well as mr wilde hath had some intimation of before adding however one circumstance not hitherto mentioned viz that he had defended his money with the utmost bravery and had dangerously wounded at least two of the three men that had attacked him this behaviour wild who not only knew the extreme readiness with which the booty had been delivered but also the constant frigidity of the count's courage highly applauded and wished he had been present to assist him the count then proceeded to animadvert on the carelessness of the watch and the scandal it was to the laws that honest people could not walk the streets in safety and after expatiating some time on that subject he asked mr wilde if he ever saw so prodigious a run of luck for so he chose to call his winning 
though he knew Wilde was well acquainted with his having loaded dice in his pocket. The other answered it was indeed prodigious, and almost sufficient to justify any person who did not know him better in suspecting his fair play. No man, I believe, dares call that in question, replied he. No, surely, says Wild, you are well known to be a man of more honour. But, pray, sir, continued he, did the rascals rob you of all? Every shilling, cries the other, with an oath, they did not leave me a single stake. While they were thus discoursing, Mr. Snap, with a gentleman who followed him, introduced Mr. Bagshot into the company. It seems Mr. Bagshot, immediately after his separation from Mr. Wilde, returned to the gaming-table, where, having trusted to fortune that treasure which he had procured by his industry, the faithless goddess committed a breach of trust, and sent Mr. Bagshot away with as empty pockets as are to be found in any laced coat in the kingdom. Now, as that gentleman was walking to a certain reputable house, or shed, in Covent Garden Market, he fortuned to meet with Mr. Snap, who had just returned from conveying the Count to his lodgings, and was then walking to and fro before the gaming-house door. For you are to know, my good reader, if you have never been a man of wit and pleasure about town, that, as the voracious pike lieth snug under some weed before the mouth of any of those little streams which discharge themselves into a large river, waiting for the small fry which issue thereout, so, hourly, before the door or mouth of these gaming-houses, doth Mr. Snap, or some other gentleman of his occupation, attend the issuing forth of the small fry of young gentlemen, to whom they deliver little slips of parchment, containing invitations of the said gentlemen to their houses, together with one Mr. John Doe. Footnote. This is a fictitious name, which is put into every writ, for what purpose the lawyers best know. Mr. John Doe, a person whose company is in great request. Mr. Snap, among many others of these billets, happened to have one directed to Mr. Bagshot, being at the suit or solicitation of one Mrs. Anne Sample, spinster, at whose house the said Bagshot had lodged several months, and which he had inadvertently departed without taking a formal leave, on which account Mrs. Anne had taken this method of speaking with him. Mr. Snap's house, being now very full of good company, he was obliged to introduce Mr. Bagshot into the Count's apartment, it being, as he said, the only chamber he had to lock up in. Mr. Wilde no sooner saw his friend than he ran eagerly to embrace him, and immediately presented him to the Count, who received him with great civility. End of Book 1, Chapter 11 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox.